Okay, Marsha, we're ready to go. Okay, I think we will get started. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Marsha Henry. I'm a legal editor for Clearinghouse Review. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we have a really interesting group of people who will, for the next hour or so, be discussing their work uh, using a human rights framework on behalf of low-income clients. Before I, we move into that discussion, though, I wanted to take just a couple of minutes to give a little background about Clearinghouse Review for those of you who may not be too familiar with it. Um, we're a bi-monthly journal, now in our 45th year of publication, uh, published by the Sergeant Shriver National Center on Poverty Law in Chicago. Our purpose essentially is to improve advocacy by acquainting our readers, most of whom are legal aid advocates who represent clients on a daily basis, um, acquainting them with the latest poverty law developments, publicizing innovative and creative strategies, and fostering communication among advocates in different parts of the country who might not otherwise know about each other's work. And we're published both online and in print. Every year, we devote one of our six issues entirely to a particular topic. And this year, our September-October issue will focus on applying a human rights lens to poverty law practice. We know that many advocates haven't had a lot of opportunity to acquaint themselves with a human rights framework or to consider how they might use it in their daily work. So we're holding this online discussion to preview some of what will be discussed in the special issue and highlight some examples of the intersection of human rights and poverty law practice. Um, over the last few years, we have published several articles on this topic, uh, one of which, and Michelle, could you put up slide two, um, is uh, an article from 2007 written by Martha Davis, who will be our moderator for today. You should have received a link to that article uh, with your reminder email that you got about this webinar yesterday. The title of that article is Human Rights in the Trenches, Using International Human Rights Law in Everyday Legal Aid Cases. Um, and you might want to refer to that for some background information. And Martha has helped us with the planning of this special issue, uh, and we really appreciate her, her input. And as I said, she'll be moderating the discussion among our panelists uh, who are, and can we go to the next slide, and you should have received a link to a page also with more information about uh, these very interesting people, but they are Chandra Bhatnagar from the ACLU Human Rights Program, Monique Hardin of Advocates for Environmental Human Rights, and Monique will be writing about her work for our September-October issue. Cheryl Heistad of the Maryland Legal Aid Bureau, and that program's human rights work was discussed in an article in our uh, January-February 2011 issue, uh, an article written by an attorney there, Peter Sabonis, and also Sarah Paletti of the University of Pennsylvania Law School's Transnational Legal Clinic, and Sarah is also an author for our September-October issue. Um, Finally, recording of today's webinar will be archived on our website at www.povertylaw.org, and you'll receive a link to that uh, within a day or two. Um, you'll also receive a brief survey that we hope that you'll fill out. It'll be of great help to us in planning uh, future articles and webinars. And we will set, a set aside time at the end, probably 20 minutes or so, for questions. So as those occur to you, please use the question box on the right of your screen to send those along, and we'll go through those. If we don't get to all of them, we'll have an archive of those as well, and we can get back to you. Um, so that's it on my end. Thanks again for joining us, and I'd like to turn it over to Martha Davis, who will start the discussion. Martha? Hmm. OK, we may be having a little technical difficulty here. Are the other panelists hearing me? Yes. OK. Um, OK, well, why don't I start with just posing this general question to all of the panelists to answer. And if Martha, is Martha hearing me now? OK. Um, we'll try to get this resolved. In the meantime, um, 
to get us started, I'd like to, to pose this question to the panelists. What does it mean to use a human rights framework in, in legal aid practice or poverty law advocacy? What do you think it adds to that work? And can you give a brief example or two from your own work of, of uh, how it enhances it? And, and Chandra, do you want to start? Sure. Thanks very much, uh, Marsha, for the opportunity to be uh, part of this webinar. Also, thanks to the Clearinghouse Review and to the Shriver uh, Center on Poverty. Um, it's a really appropriate and kind of timely topic, and I'm, I'm grateful to be joined with some other really awesome activists. So uh, the, the initial kind of question in terms of what is the value added um, of using human rights in your, in your work, um, your legal aid advocacy or your work serving low-income populations, it's really, I think the first uh, kind of central point is that Human rights are a, are a complementary tool to, no one is suggesting it's a magic bullet or that you need to throw out everything that you're already doing um, on behalf of these populations or in, in partnership with local community. It's simply another toolkit, another set of, of um, approaches, strategies, standards, um, and, and fora that you can use in a complementary and strategic fashion to really enhance um, the work that you're already doing. So um, I think others will get into some of their uh, their kind of analysis of what that means, but um, I, I wanted to begin with an example um, of a partnership that we did with the um, Border Network for Human Rights and the ACLU of Texas, and the mechanism that we used was a treaty reporting um, opportunity. So the U.S. has signed and ratified three major international treaties. One of them is uh, the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and as part of its obligations under that treaty, the U.S. has to report on its compliance regularly uh, before the UN Human Rights Committee, which is the international body of experts who um, uh, basically oversees compliance with the terms of the treaty. And that body is comprised of internationally recognized folks. They're not a political group. They're former judges, law professors, a very, very credible group of folks. And um, we had been working with the ACLU of Texas and with the Border Network on the epidemic of racial profiling in Texas and really specifically in the city of El Paso where there was this renegade sheriff who had taken it upon himself. And this is back in 2005. Um, well before SB 1070 became uh, the talk of the town, um, he took it upon himself to uh, initiate a, a program where he was going to stop uh, through roadblocks um, in El Paso people who were undocumented and, and detain them for the purpose of eventually deporting them. It was called Operation Linebacker. Um, and it was supposedly going to target violent criminals and drug traffickers, but its impact was that the sheriff's deputies were stopping people of color and especially Latino people in poor neighborhoods of El Paso for minor traffic violations and then asking for identification and social security cards. And it was a really abusive um, program. The El Paso Times in the first six months of 2006 did a story on the, uh, on the program and found that 4,756 undocumented people had been turned over to the Border Patrol in, that, in six months, the first six months of 2006. That gives Excuse a sense me of for interrupting, but I just we do have a slide showing that, so I'm just going to ask Michelle to put to put that slide up as you're discussing this. Oh. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. No. Not at all. Thank you. This is Martha. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes, we can. Great. Okay. Good. So go ahead. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you're, you can take it from here. Great. Okay. Thanks, uh, Martha, and thanks, Marcia. Um, and and the slide, as you all see, so um, the sheriff, who's uh, Lee Samianago, was an elected sheriff um, of long standing. Uh, he enjoyed strong support from El Paso's mayor. Um, and there was a, a rising tide of kind of anti-immigrant sentiment. So the border network, who had been organizing uh, with local allies and community members for several months, um, had been pressuring the mayor to uh, encourage the, the sheriff to eliminate this program, to suspend the program, to, to basically do something to protect the rights of, uh, of El Paso residents. But there was no progress that was really being made in that regard. So after we organized a strategic kind of conference to address these issues, and then documented some of the violations, had a day of action, a speak out, um, met with community members, but still we weren't able to really move the ball forward. So we used the opportunity of the U.S. having to report its human rights violations or its human rights record before the U.N. Human Rights Committee to take specific information from El Paso um, and bring it to the U.N. Um, and the timing was such that it was within a month or so of when, our, when the documentation took place. So we had new information that was fresh that didn't even make it into our report or uh, the reports of other uh, organizations that were submitted to the committee. And while we were in Geneva, we were able to get the attention of one of the Human Rights Committee members 
um, from Argentina who was very interested in the problem of racial profiling. And he raised a question before the uh, U.S. delegation. And the U.S. delegation was comprised of you know, senior level members of the Bush administration in, in various agencies. And the legal advisor to Condoleezza Rice, um, John Bellinger, was there. Uh, High-level people from Homeland Security, from the Juan Kim, director of the Civil Rights Division at DOJ, was there. So the, he asked a question of Juan Kim about racial profiling and specifically mentioned El Paso and the really egregious violations that had been documented by the Border Network and by ACLU of Texas and local community members. And of course, Juan Kim was unable to answer the question and didn't really have much of an answer at all. And the impact on the ground was the fact that this question was asked resulted in, you'll see on the slide, this huge above the fold headline on the front page of the El Diario del Paso, which is the kind of biggest Spanish language newspaper in El Paso, which mentions that, you know, the sheriff was taken to the UN for human rights abuses. And that really changed the political dynamic in El Paso um, around this issue. The mayor subsequently stepped away from supporting the sheriff. A lot of the black Latino Asian legislators in the uh, Texas legislature who had not really returned a lot of phone calls prior to that were all of a sudden really interested in the issue and began coming to El Paso and political pressure was raised and eventually the mayor stepped away from the sheriff and uh, the sheriff quote unquote voluntarily suspended the program and subsequently he was actually lost his reelection. Um, so what, I mean this was just an example of the perfect storm of factors coming together of local activists doing documentation and you know using that as a, as a pressure point with a treaty body getting um, question put before the U.S. and then when the U.S. wasn't able to answer, getting a concluding observation, which is the kind of report card that the committee gives at the end of the day about racial profiling and, and the attention given to the local violation so that you're able to really put a microscope. So the kind of takeaway point is that if you can use a human rights strategy kind of in, con in con uh, confluence with other uh, strategies that you're using and especially if you're able to tie a media element into it and get kind of sunlight onto a particular issue and a particular violation in certain areas that can really enhance your local kind of advocacy. So I'll end there and allow the next person to jump on. Great, Sandra. Thanks very much. Um, and sorry again for just popping on a little late, I, though I wasn't late. I just was muted. Um, so uh, Monique, I want to ask you the, the same question now, which is um, what does it mean to use a human rights framework in, in your advocacy and what does it add to your work? And, and then maybe you can give us an example or two as well. Sure. Um, for us, the human rights uh, framework offers the opportunity of finding remedies for what are essentially human rights violations uh, that are occurring across the United States and communities that um, are in the shadows of toxic industrial facilities um, that are destroying natural resources through depletion or contamination and harming the health of residents who live within the vicinity of uh, uh, with uh, of the toxic chemicals that are emitted from uh, these uh, industrial facilities. Um, it was uh, uh, prior to the founding of Advocates for Environmental Human Rights, uh, a community activist in Louisiana had told us that this, no one has to tell me when my daughter's human rights are violated. Uh, she feels it every time she struggles to breathe at night when the industrial facilities are at their worst, belching toxic fumes into the air. Um, and that really launched us uh, at Natalie Walker and myself as co-founders of Advocates for Environmental Human Rights in search of the human rights remedies for these human rights violations that are commonly referred to as environmental injustice and environmental racism. And what we found was, uh, as Chandra was alluding to, uh, relevant uh, ratified treaties that um, uh, protect the rights of people the, in terms of the right to life, the right to health, the right to freedom from racial discrimination. Um, and so these human rights uh, treaties serve as a ruler, um, for us anyway, in looking at how uh, short um, uh, the system of environmental protection um, falls with regards to uh, these human rights standards and the way in which they've been interpreted and applied abroad in the development of environmental human rights law and the protection of people from um, toxic chemicals and other environmental hazards as a matter of human dignity and respect for fundamental human rights. Uh, in March of uh, 2005, we filed the first ever legal challenge uh, against the United States 
uh, government for establishing an environmental regulatory system that denies basic human rights. Uh, we, this, in this petition, we represent uh, residents of Mossville, Louisiana, uh, located in the southwest uh, portion of the state near the Texas border. It's a historic African American community that's not incorporated. Um, Mossville is surrounded by 14 toxic industrial facilities, all permitted pursuant to environmental law uh, with the uh, right to damage the environment and harm the health of the residents who live there and have been living there for hundreds of years and have settled the area and made it their home. But uh, it's really been transformed into a massive industrial operation where you not only have the facilities, but outside of the facilities and throughout the community, you, you have um, uh, above ground uh, pipelines carrying toxic chemicals from one facility to the other. Those pipelines also exist underground. There are a number of um, uh, train tracks uh, uh, that crisscross the community so that you can't enter or exit Mossville without crossing one of these train tracks. And on these trains uh, are the flammable and toxic uh, chemicals and uh, oils and fuels uh, manufactured at these facilities going to markets. Uh, the petition that we filed with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights challenging the U.S. government's environmental regulatory system was recently uh, admitted for a review on the merits, which marked the first time uh, that the Inter-American Commission has taken jurisdiction over a case of environmental racism in the United States based on the finding that there's no legal remedy within the United States for people like the residents of Mossville who are struggling to achieve environmental justice but do not have um, uh, uh, do not have the right to do so uh, pursuant to the laws that we've got on the books, uh, not, uh, notwithstanding the human rights obligations of our government. So this, uh, the case, the Mossville Human Rights case is moving forward uh, with uh, anticipating a hearing uh, on the merits before the Inter-American Commission. I should maybe say that the Inter-American Commission serves as the judicial arm of the Organization of American States, which uh, the United States is a member of the Organization of American States. It's like the Western Hemispheric Regional Human Rights System with 34 other member countries. Um, and as, um, uh, as a member of the Organization of American States, the U.S. government is obligated to protect the rights um, enshrined in the, uh, the uh, the Convention on the Rights and Duties, the Inter-American um, Convention on the Rights and Duties of Man. Um, and I, I guess just add, uh, quickly, you know, having this human rights uh, uh, perspective and advocacy has really uh, helped us in terms of dealing with the uh, consequences of internal displacement uh, uh, with Hurricane Katrina. And again, building more advocacy around human rights standards that need to apply in the United States for ensuring recovery of people once they're displaced. Um, in some ways, very similar to the environmental regulatory system, the domestic laws that we have in place actually de um, uh, make all decisions by government in the time of a, a national disaster discretionary and explicitly denies an individual who's harmed by a national disaster the right to claim assistance or anything, including the reduction of life-threatening risks, emergency medical care, food, housing, et cetera. So what people saw on their TV screens, what many of us suffered in the days after Hurricane Katrina, as horrendous and nightmarish as it was, it was never illegal under U.S. laws. Uh, but it is, uh, uh, the governmental response has been um, determined to, uh, to be out of compliance with the human rights uh, treaties that have been ratified, the, namely the International uh, Convention on Civil and Political Rights, as well as the um, um, uh, the CERD Conventions, uh, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. Um, one of the so therefore one of the other areas that we're working on is getting U.S. adoption of the human rights standard uh, for issues of displacement and major disasters, which is called the UN Guiding Principles on Internal Displacement. So for us, human rights is extremely important in terms of saving the, the people uh, who uh, are subjected to displacement, whether it's from an environmental hazard or governmental decisions that uh, ignore the right to recovery in the event of a national disaster.
Great. Okay. Thank you, Monique. Um, it's really innovative work. Um, let me turn to uh, Cheryl then and, and ask you to take a few minutes to, to tell us about, I know, the really interesting work that's going on in Maryland Legal Aid and what you found it, it, it means to use the human rights framework in the advocacy that you do there. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to do it. And it's, it's very interesting to hear what, what other folks have been doing. We're somewhat different. We're a statewide legal services program. And we do, we're LSC funded. We do everyday legal work. Um, and we, um, we actually struggled with this question of what does it mean to have a human rights framework. And we realized it actually means different things to different people, even within our organization. <laughs> And so it is really important to define what it means. Um, and we've broken it down into three different components that have helped us figure out how we want to use the human rights framework. And the first, and I think the biggest piece of it that's been very helpful to us is just thinking about human rights as values and that those values remind us to treat all humans with dignity and fairness and equality and opportunity and all those things that we've actually all worked for for many years but haven't really talked about them necessarily in the human rights uh, context. And that's something that's resonated with our staff, with our clients, with people that we talk to about human rights. People get the human rights values. It's very important and it, and it really resonates with people. We also have the, the second piece of it is human rights as laws and as the treaties and the tools. And like Chandra was mentioning, it's a whole other set of tools that we've realized we can use uh, for our clients. And the third piece of it is really human rights as the broader movement um, that we didn't even realize existed, that there are all these groups and all these people working out there on human rights issues. And if we start talking about our traditional legal services issues that um, we've worked on for many years as human rights issues, because that's what they are, we can connect with a whole group of folks that we've never worked with before. And they can help us really achieve the change that we want to for our clients. So that's how we've uh, articulated for ourselves what having a human rights framework means. Um, and I just want to give you a couple simple examples of how we've used it. Um, and there are some great examples that were in the Clearinghouse article that uh, Marcia mentioned at the beginning that uh, was in the January and February um, issue of Clearinghouse this year about our program and about um, why we adopted the human rights framework. So I want to give you some some new ones that weren't in that article. Um, we actually recently filed um, a few complaints with our State Department of Education on behalf of foster care children that we represent. And those children were denied various educational rights. And as part of the complaint, we put into our complaint the re references to the uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child, we talked about some of the rights that are guaranteed in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, even though this is not a treaty that the United States has ratified. Um, but we put it in there, and we used it to help flesh out our argument and to make the points we wanted to make. And somewhat to our surprise, we found that actually the state officials were very interested and intrigued by the human rights argument. We arguments that we put in there, we thought they would somewhat ignore it and just not pay attention to it. So um, we've been kind of over and over again surprised by the responses that we've got when we've raised human rights arguments in forums that you wouldn't necessarily expect that people would be receptive to them. Um, this is relatively new for us, so we're still uh, working on ideas of how to keep raising these issues in various types of cases. Um, and so that was a, something new that we're that we're working on. And we're, there's some of these uh, complaints we filed with the State Department of Education are still winding their way through. But at least so far, we feel like it's actually had an impact on our advocacy in a positive way. We're also working um, on some amicus briefs re revolving around housing issues. And we're using the international standards that are in some of the international treaties in order to argue how the Maryland appellate court should rule on this particular housing issue. So we're actually finding it very helpful 
in terms of just how we look at cases, how we frame our arguments, even if we may not necessarily decide to cite to an international treaty, we've taken language from treaties because the language is very powerful and use that to help our state law argument that we might be making. Um, and so this is just a few, few samples of how uh, we've been trying to incorporate the work into our, what most people call kind of everyday legal aid work. Rachel, thanks. Those are great examples for the next article. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, now let me turn to Sarah, um, Sarah Paoletti, and ask you, um, how have you used human rights frameworks in your work, and, and maybe give us a couple of examples? Sure. I mean, I think um, some of what you hear, and I, I come at this now from a slightly different perspective, although informed by my experiences as a farm worker attorney um, for migrant farm workers here in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, with a statewide non-LSC funded program for many years, um, but now come at it from the perspective of an international human rights clinical program, um, where this is this is this is what we do. Um, but I think some of what you're hearing uh, is that the human rights framework really does provide us a more expansive paradigm for thinking about our clients' rights. Uh, and often does so in a way that speaks to their experiences and their desires um, and grounded in notions of dignity and respect that provide sort of a set of rights to individuals just for the purposes, just because they are um, human beings. And I have on my, on my desk at, at work a picture from a protest that or a demonstration that some of the mushroom workers here in Pennsylvania did outside the Pennsylvania Supreme Court here in Philadelphia many years ago when they were fighting for the right to collective bargaining under the State Labor Relations Act. Uh, because as many of you may know, the agricultural workers are excluded from protection under the National Labor Relations Act together with domestic workers. Uh, and the sign that one of the workers um, is carrying says, Merecemos respeto, seguridad y justicia. Somos humanos también. Um, and since we deserve respect, security, and justice. We are humans also. Uh, and it just sort of reminds me to think back in the civil rights movement and the, and the signs that people carried, I am man, and to remember as we come back to sort of Cheryl was saying about um, the values that come out of the human rights movement that, and the human rights language that we can try to think about um, as we try to think more creatively about what we can do on behalf of our clients when the traditional litigation, one-on-one -on -one client representation, or even class action, as we just saw in the Walmart case, um, in, the, in the litigation framework is becoming less and less um, sort of the panacea for our clients' um, problems, and, and we need to be more expansive in thinking about our, our rights and how we access them. And, and I, so I'll talk a little bit just in the context of discrimination. I think so often when I was out doing farm worker uh, representation and outreach, my clients would, would come up to me and, and they could have any one of, of a number of complaints. Um, and my frame of reference was, OK, this, if you're trying to make a discrimination claim, and it was often in their mind framed in the context of discrimination. Um, and in trying to make a discrimination claim under U.S. law or under state law, I was thinking, well, do you have 15 or more employees for 20 or more weeks, which doesn't always happen in agriculture in Pennsylvania, and who are the other workers in the workforce, and how can I make out a disparate impact claim when the entire workforce is Mexican or the entire workforce is Guatemalan, um, or where there are no women, um, how can I sort of try to fit this discrimination into the context of a discrimination, a viable discrimination claim, um, and, and found that to be very difficult, uh, and, and all the more difficult after the Supreme Court ruled in the Hoffman Plastics decision uh, in which it denied the right of back pay to worker, a worker who was uh, fired for engaging in concerted protected activity. Um, and that has had a, a spillover effect in other areas, and particularly in the context of discrimination. Um, and so we have been trying to raise the issue of non-discrimination towards 
uh, migrant workers more generally, raising specific issues around agricultural workers and, and domestic workers and talking about statutory exclusions, raising issues specific to undocumented workers and talking about and H-2B workers, uh, guest workers and talking about LSC restrictions and access to the judicial system, uh, as well as just access to remedies, particularly in the, in the post-Hoffman era. Um, and trying to sort of think more expansively about how do we effectuate the right to non-discrimination, which under, under the International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, under the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, the Inter-American Declaration, all have a much broader definition of discrimination um, and, and recognize that individuals cannot be discriminated on the basis of national origin, ethnicity, race, language, um, or other social status, and really gives us different hooks for looking at the variety of ways that individuals are discriminated against. Um, but also um, creates an affirmative obligation on the government to remedy discrimination where discrimination exists. Um, and so even though most of the actions um, that we see in the context of employment are at the hands of individual employers. It is thinking about what affirmative obligation does government have, what policies and practices that are being instituted, implemented um, by the U.S. government um, or, or by the state government are having a negative impact on the um, discrimination experienced by, by low-wage immigrant workers. Um, and so together with Chandra and his colleagues at the ACLU and the National Employment Law Project, we filed a complaint at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights raising the issue of the rights of undocumented workers in the United States post-Hoffman. There's a very strong decision out of the Inter-American Court on Human Rights um, recognizing the right to non-discrimination in all aspects of employment. So once an individual is engaged in the employment relationship, um, there can be no discrimination in the terms and conditions of employment and the benefits that derive from that employment. Um, and so trying to think then about what are specific asks coming out of that. Um, and we've raised these issues before the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination as well as, as in looking at um, the right to freedom of association, which comes up in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the right um, of access to the judiciary and access to the justice system. And we've gotten very strong language out of the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination on the Hoffman decision in particular, um, calling for a legislative fix to Hoffman. Um, and as we've just gone through the Universal Periodic Review, the United States just did a review on its uh, human rights record before the uh, UN Human Rights Council through a process called the Universal Periodic Review. And we got several recommendations towards the United States around the rights of migrant workers, low-wage workers, domestic workers, um, agricultural workers, and other workers who are typically excluded from the full benefits um, of our judicial system uh, and full rights and remedies under our labor and employment laws. Um, and I think one of the ways that we have sort of succeeded in, in pushing the argument a little bit is um, in something else that was alluded to earlier in the coalition building. Um, when you start engaging in the human rights framework, I think you start looking for different allies and finding different allies. Because what so often happens and, and what gets stripped away, I think, in, in trying to do the domestic litigation is a need for the recognition of the multiplicities of, of discrimination. Um, and the various ways in which one person's struggle is linked to another person's struggle and finding ways to bring those together. Um, and I would, I don't claim any credit from the international advocacy, but at least there was synergy in the Department of Labor recently reissuing um, a memorandum of understanding with the Department of Homeland Security with ICE that establishes a firewall between labor law enforcement and immigration law enforcement, which is something that we've been asking for before the international bodies for, for a long time um, and had been asking for again through the Universal Periodic Review, and that just came out uh, a couple of months ago. Um, 
So I think it's a, using the human rights framework, as, as Chandra said, it, it's complementary to the work that you may otherwise be doing. And it's trying to think about how strategically we can go back to thinking more fundamentally about concepts of human dignity um, and more broadly under sort of this broader paradigm and more expansive paradigm that human rights gets us. And then we can sort of pull it apart and pick it apart and form coalitions and see where the different pressure points might be and, and the ways in which the human rights mechanisms and frameworks can aid us in that work. That's great, Sarah. Thanks. Um, so, so we've heard from, from four pretty different, but you know, sharing some commonalities, um, four pretty different uh, folks about how they've used human rights in their advocacy. I wanted to just say a word about the the sort of national context in which we're having this discussion. Um, I'm sure many of you know have read about the, the attack on judicial consideration of foreign and international law, um, which has been extended for a few years now in the federal area and now has shipped to state courts. And so in the past few months, um, more than 20 states have considered statutes or constitutional amendments that would bar consideration of international law, um, in, which would include human rights law by state court judges. and um, you know, of course, this has a chilling impact, but I wanted to just make a couple of points about this context. And first, you know, as we've heard from, uh, particularly from Chanda, from, from, uh, but from also from Sarah and, and Monique and Cheryl, is that the, the is that the human rights advocacy that they're involved in doesn't only involve litigation. So, of course, the campaign to bar international law in state courts only would affect litigation, um, and there are other strategies as well. But but second, I'm also finding, as I talk to folks, um, uh, that these proposals have really started to open up a dialogue. Um, so there's a kind of a silver lining, a dialogue about the extent to which international law and foreign law are already totally perme permeate our legal system. And so um, I think that many of the um, states that are looking at this are finding that it's really impossible to bar international and foreign law from the courts without really damaging the legal system. And so I think while um, there's a lot of concern in the short term about this uh, wave of activity. I would, I predict as in the long term that um, it's, it's not going to stick and that uh, while I don't want to minimize the chilling effect in the short term and the impact that it can have on advocates, um, I'd be very surprised if it went, uh, went very far at all. Um, so having, having said that, I wanted to turn back to the panelists. Well, two things actually. I wanted to remind people to send questions. Um, and use the chat box. We're starting to get a few now, so I hope that people will continue to do that as we talk, and then we'll turn to the questions um, uh, at, the, at the end of uh, our time here. But I also wanted to then turn back to the panelists and ask, a few, ask them a few questions about the human rights framework. And one thing that strikes me is that we've been using the term framework um, as we've been talking about it. And I wanted to hear from you about how you respond to skeptics about this approach. Um, and one of the things that I've heard is the question, you know, is this really law, you know, or is this just a framing device? Um, and if it is law, is there something different about how you use this human rights law than you would use some other legal tool? Is there something uh, different, some different kind of mindset that um, advocates need to have when using human rights law than um, the mindset that they might have in using uh, domestic uh, approaches? Um, and then the sort of second part of that question is, how do you translate these arguments into making a difference on the ground? And this raises the enforcement issue, which I think Sarah particularly uh, touched on, the, the sorts of different places that Sarah had to go in order to finally uh, get some enforcement, um, very different than the kind of profile that you see in, in domestic litigation. So I wonder if you could comment on that as well. Um, so anybody want to volunteer, or shall I call on someone? Sure. Uh, whatever you prefer, Martha. Okay. Well, Chandra, I'll, I'll turn to you. <laughs> All right. Um, so it, it, is, it is the answer to the question. It is law. Um, there are three primary sources of international law. There, is, there are treaties, uh, internationally uh, ratified agreements uh, between states. There is customary international law, and there are what's called standards, principles, and UN resolutions, which are otherwise referred to as soft law. Um, it, uh, customary international law essentially is the evolving jurisprudence of uh, nations around the world, and that the uh, U.S. most recently, in a case called Sosa v. Alvarez McCain, um, held that there are a narrow class of um, a narrow class of specific uh, international norms that remain enforceable in domestic courts. And and I'll just read a little bit uh, a short excerpt of the court's decision in Sosa. 
um, which reestablishes the existence of customary international law. Um, for two centuries, we've affirmed that the domestic law of the United States recognizes the law of nations. The example Sabatino, it is of course true that the United States courts apply international law as a part of our own in appropriate circumstances. Paquette Habana, international law is part of our law and must be ascertained and administered by the courts of justice of appropriate jurisdiction as often as questions of right depending upon it are duly presented for their determination. Nareed, the court is bound by the law of nations, which is a part of the law of the land. Um, and Texas Industries v. Radcliffe, recognizing that international disputes implicating our relations with foreign nations are one of the narrow areas in which federal common law continues to exist. The court continues, it would take some explaining to say now that federal courts must avert their gaze entirely from any international norm intended to protect individuals. So thus, international law is truly our law in, in the form of customary international law. And while that may be a narrow scope, it, it does remain, it does exist. Um, treaties, which uh, you know, we spent some time discussing earlier, vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, uh, via the supremacy clause of the U.S. Constitution, they are the supreme law of the land. And the supremacy clause of the U.S. Constitution, Article 6, Section 1, Clause 2 states, this Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby, anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. So the, the treaties and, and um, customary international law are law. Now, you don't have a private right of action. You cannot sue based upon a violation of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights or the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. However, you can appropriately, you know, in, in the persuasive context, um, cite to uh, the, the existence of these um, international instruments. And often in the form of amicus briefs, the Supreme Court has considered the uh, relevant international standards um, of instruments that the U.S. has signed and ratified as well as some instruments that the U.S. hasn't signed and ratified. And, um, and in terms of litigation, I'm, you know, for those of us that litigate, there, there are two real primary ways to incorporate human rights in litigation. There's a direct application um, and there's an indirect application. And the direct application can come through the form of statutes, the Alien Tort Statute, um, uh, 1350. Uh, Florida is a case a lot of folks are familiar with. Um, the then there's also other statutes like the Torture Victims Protection Act, the Trafficking Victim Protection Act, and the Foreign Affairs Reform and Restructuring Act, which implements CAT. Uh, and there's also 1983, which you know creatively can be used. Um, the and laws provision of 1983 can be used creatively in some circumstances, or could be used creatively in some circumstances to invoke international law. And then there's indirect application, which is kind of that there's a principle of statutory interpretation from a case called Charming Betsy, which was from like 1804. Um, where you could use international law to inform the interpretation of state and federal constitutions and other law. And the, essentially the, the opinion by Justice Marshall in that case was that when it's unclear what the framers of a congressional statute intended, that statute should be construed consistent with the, quote, law of nations. And so that's another vehicle uh, to get international law introduced into um, kind of legislative intent or, or statutory interpretation. And I'll just end with saying that the idea of using international and foreign law, and ironically, as we're fighting, you know, we're, we're litigating this case in Oklahoma um, and are really awaiting a decision now from the Tenth Circuit on the preliminary injunction. And uh, the, the irony of all of this is that the folks who are advocating that, you know, judges should not be allowed to consider international or foreign law or Sharia law, that, and they consider themselves to be defenders of the Constitution or, you know, originalists or whatever it might be, that their position could not be further from the origins of American jurisprudence and American constitutionalism because at, in the wake of the creation of a new country, it was, you know, judges routinely considered international and foreign law. Marbury versus Madison cites British law. Um, and there's a number of seminal cases which look to foreign decisions and international principles because there was no other jurisprudence for the court to consider in the early 1800s. So, ahistorical to be making these arguments, and I think as Martha suggested, you know, it would cause chaos in the courts if judges were, were to be unable to consider international foreign law, as well as in the context of international law and ratified treaties, would actually go against the principles of the Supremacy Clause of the U.S. Constitution, the Full Faith and Credit Clause, and, and would have many other problems. So that's a, a short answer to that, somewhat short answer to that. Mm -hmm. any, other, any other thoughts about that issue? Cheryl, I wanted to ask you, you said um, that Legal Aid Society is actually um, using human rights law in some of their um, litigation. How do you decide when to use it? Well, basically, um, you know, we have, and I guess I want to 
say something before going to that first, which is in relation to your question you just asked, and which is kind of like how 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 do you raise these things in in state courts? And and I think everything Chandra said is is really helpful and valuable. But the pushback we got in our program, and I think a lot of other folks who might be considering do the, doing this might get, which is you know we go into court every day and we can't even get the judges to listen to us about what the state law says. How are we going to get them to pay attention to this international law that is totally foreign to them? Sometimes in our state courts the, the judges have been known to say, you know, well, they don't even want to look at the federal law because they don't think mm -hmm. that applies to them. So it is a challenge, I think, on the ground and the practical reality of, of trying to raise these issues in um, individual cases. We um, we haven't really been raising human rights law on a uh, in litigation on a day to day basis yet. In this partly because this is all a new thing for us. I mean, it's relatively new, and we're still um, trying to figure out what makes sense in terms of when to raise it. And given what I just said about you know the reality on the ground of walking into rent court and trying to make an argument to the judge who doesn't want to hear any legal argument, much less. Um, an international law argument. We have raised the issue more often in policy work where it's you know human rights um, treaties and human rights law has been very valuable to us and when we've um, been doing legislative work, when we've been commenting on um, policy decisions that are being made by the state government. And it fits really easily in the policy context. Um, we did the complaint. we. We, um, like I said, included them in complaints that we have filed with the State Department of Education, but that's an administrative proceeding, not a court litigation. We're really kind of treading carefully on how we're going to raise it in state court. Um, we are doing this amicus brief, which is a great way. I think Chandra mentioned and others mentioned doing uh, raising these issues in amicus briefs because you're not, you know, you're you can say a lot of things in an amicus brief that you might not. I actually want to say if you're representing a party in the case. So we find we, we're thinking that to the court. Yeah. We're we're thinking I'm that sorry, to, so you can start to educate the court about yes. as well. Right? Starting to educate the court, starting to have people start thinking about some of these ideas is really I think really helpful. But we are looking really carefully at our different practice areas and trying to develop strategies where we think actually raising human rights law referencing human rights law might be add value to it. And it's one of the things that actually several folks suggested when we first started this was, you know, think about the human rights aspects, think about the human rights law, help that frame your argument. But you really need to think about what value is it adding to this particular case and does it make sense to actually articulate to the court the human rights statute if you think that's just going to make their them turn off to your argument. Mm -hmm. So you have to really consider your audience when you're, I think, when you're raising human rights treaties and statutes. And I think that um, that's what we're trying to do. And we're trying to, we don't want to um, raise it in a context where it, it actually gets us kind of a lot of negative feedback when we're treading a little bit lightly, I would say, and particularly in the state court trial context um, where uh, we're not as convinced the judges will be as open to it. And it's it's quite interesting. We're, I mean, we're getting great response from clients that we talk to, to our other legal services partners, funders. Everyone else in the world seems to be really open to the human rights arguments. And the judges, the feedback has not been quite as <laughs> positive, but we're hoping, you know, we're, we're, we're pushing in that direction. Mm -hmm. And one thing, of course, that's happening is that there's more and more attention to this in law schools, which, um, you know, in the long run will make a difference in terms of judges and their clerks and so on. And you know what, that is an, that's a wonderful point that I wanted to make. One of the things that when we were talking about value added that none of us realized that, that this was going to um, add to our program is that so many people are learning about human rights law in law school and it's it's amazing all the great uh, folks that we've had applying to work here because they know we're focusing on human rights issues and we're getting just wonderful applicants with 
uh, great ideas. And I do think that's a, a good point that I think we are progr it's a progressive realization of recognizing human rights in the United States. A lot of the judges that have been on the bench for 30 years never learned anything about human rights when they were in law school. And it's a very foreign concept to them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, thanks, thanks, Cheryl. So um, Monique, I mentioned enforcement earlier, and I was particularly thinking of you because you um, you're using uh, human rights law before the Inter-American Mission really to address a, a, a gap in, in U.S. law. Um, but what's your plan then for enforcement um, when you get a, a good decision from the Inter-American Commission? Are you suggesting that the United States would not be amenable to the <laughs> decision? Of course not. <laughs> well, um, we have an enforcement strategy. I don't want to give all of it away, but um, you know, I, I, as anyone can imagine, um, Brown v. Board of Education decision from the Supreme Court it needed a massive enforcement strategy, and uh, you know, I, I think as the nascent uh, work around human rights. Uh, achieving human rights remedies through litigation uh, and other forms of advocacy such as uh, uh, going before you and United Nations treaty monitoring bodies. Uh, each, uh, each effort, uh, you can't just end with uh, you know, the work in preparing and filing a great complaint. It's got to uh, also include uh, an enforcement strategy. And so we've um, we developed and you know continue to revise and sharpen um, the enforcement strategies we ha we are uh, uh, planning for and currently underway for uh, both the Moscow human rights case and the work towards um, getting the U.S. government to um, comply with the concluding observations of not one but two treaty monitoring. Uh, bodies uh, calling on our government to apply domestically uh, the UN guiding principles on internal displacement uh, in the event of national disasters. Um, so, you know, part of the enforcement strategy has got to overcome the challenge that we all have as, uh, you know, a residents of the United States, which is that it's not part of our uh, formal or informal education as we uh, uh, grow, uh, you know, from childhood into adulthood, and uh, w uh, connecting people who um, understand, live with, they have some experience with uh, the the issues, the justice issues at the center of the human rights complaint is extremely important. So, being able to get as many uh, uh, advocacy organizations, research groups, um, uh, uh, um, organizations that focus on public awareness campaigns and education uh, programs to file amicus briefs or supporting documents. As a, it's, it's a way in which they can get uh, more experience with applying human rights standards to the uh, 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 to the work that they're doing, but also in connection with uh, a particular case that's. Uh, or issue that's before um, the Inter-American Commission or a treaty monitoring body. I think also uh, having understanding the history of U.S. government's um, reliance or dependence on human rights decisions are extremely important to have and to be able to educate people about. Um, a lot of people may not be aware of the number of times under both democratically controlled and Republican-controlled um, uh, congressional sessions, both out of the Senate and the House Representatives, the number of resolutions that have called for, uh, that, that have um, reinforced the decisions made by the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, uh, as well as federal law that actually have provisions that defer to decisions by the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. So that should, you know, there needs to be uh, a strategy for enforcement uh, is what I would say in a nutshell, and it, it needs to, you know, ensure that you, you know, are able to reach a critical mass of support uh, within um, uh, affected communities and people who are uh, have some experience with the issues, the justice issues at the center of of the uh, the human rights um, work that you're 
work that you're um, leading. So you, you don't really see it as qualitatively different than the kind of enforcement that you do for, for other kinds of litigation as well? Well, I, I, think, I think with any kind of uh, litigation brought in support of the, you know, the, the, the dignity of people or a person who um, has historically uh, suffered uh, marginalization in this country is always going to be difficult. I mean, case in point would be um, uh, the uh, people who've been on death row uh, um, with, uh, with, with no evidence showing that they were at all guilty and are, you know, kind of caught in this uh, dilemma of not, uh, where they have judgments saying that they should be compensated, but there's, there's a, you know, um, uh, the work by the criminal justice system or state attorney generals and prosecutors has been to stymie, block, create barriers to receiving that compensation. So how do you get just enforcement in situations like that? So I think as folks who have dedicated themselves to public interest law, um, it, enforcement is always going to be an issue, and I think it. And I don't really see it any different in a, a, a context of domestic law versus human rights law. It, it's something that needs to be part of any, um, uh, you know, uh, dedication of resources towards a, a, a legal case or advocacy campaign. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. So, so of course, I have more questions, but I know we've been getting a bunch of uh, questions from from folks who are online here. Um, so, uh, Marsha, um, can we turn to the questions? Sure, sure. Okay. Do you want to? Uh, and let me just say, uh, initially, we had thought of doing this uh, discussion as a, a preview of our print September-October issue, and I didn't really mean for it to be a teaser, but in fact some of the questions uh, can be answered with articles <laughs> that are going to appear in that. So for example, um, we'll have one on uh, engaging with federal agencies on a human right to housing and uh, analyzing uh, health care, the right to health care through a, a human rights lens and so forth. So I do hope people will watch out for those, and uh, which is not to say that we shouldn't direct those questions to panelists now, but there are a number of questions. So um, I just thought I would throw that out. But Martha, do you want to sort through the questions? or? Sure, sure. Um, I'm just looking at one that arrived pretty recently that I think um, is something that maybe Sarah can speak to. So let me um, ask that. Uh, the question is, uh, are any of the folks on the panel uh, or their organizations uh, taking steps to push the presidential administration and Congress to not only ratify um, human rights treaties that are outstanding, but also implement human rights domestically? So much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so much, yeah. So um, thanks for the, for the question. Um, and I think this, I'm going to sort of dovetail this a little bit to the skepticism question. Um, only because I think one of the things that I often get in the skepticism question is, um, you know, we just don't have time to take this on. Um, and I think my pitch to the, to the legal services community has been that legal services attorneys really are in a very unique role and can play a very critical role in translating their client stories um, into the international human rights advocacy and, and vice versa. Uh, and there are many people like law school clinics, uh, human rights law school clinics like my own, who are happy to help and facilitate in that translation process. But I think it's the, the frontline legal services attorneys who really see where the domestic law falls short and fails, um, fails our clients. And, and also are in the, probably the best position to, to work with their clients to try to identify some of the remedies. Um, whether they be policy fixes, legislative fixes, or others. Um, and so I hope that through this conversation and others, um, and the conversations that we've been having through the Universal Periodic Review, which I'll talk about more, um, that we'll be able to really continue this dialogue and, and advance some of those discussions so that you, know, you don't have to be doing a case at the Inter-American Commission or filing a complaint um, or filing a report with the UN um, to think about how to use the framework or try to come up with some way to convince a, a judge 
to grant a human rights argument um, or to, to rule on a human rights argument in a piece of litigation. I think there are many ways to think about how to use the, the mechanisms and the, and the framework and the different roles that people can play. Which brings me to the, to the question about domestic implementation and treaty ratification. Um, the U.S., I mentioned earlier, the United States went through its review on November 5th before the U.N. Human Rights Council through a process called the Universal Periodic Review that all 192 member countries of the United Nations um, go through um, on what had been a four-year cycle. It looks like they're going to expand it and give more time and make it a four-and-a-half-year cycle. Uh, and it was a new process created in 96 when they created the Human Rights Council. Um, and so this was the United States' first ever review process. They took it upon themselves, this administration, um, led by the State Department and the Justice Department, but, but from the perspective of the State Department, saw their participation in the Universal Periodic Review as an opportunity to re-engage with the Human Rights Council in ways that the Bush administration had affirmatively not. Um, and uh, to demonstrate the value of civil society engagement, civil society participation to a free and open democracy as their foreign policy agenda in this process. Um, and so with that in mind, they conducted 11 consultations in cities across the country um, that were really held as listening sessions more than I think as, as consultations with a with the give and take that advocates would have hoped for. Um, but listening sessions where people came and they brought together representatives from almost all of the federal agencies to many of the consultations, uh, representatives, some representatives from state and local government, although we'd like to see more of that, with the advocacy community from those cities um, or with particular expertise in the subject matters that they were interested in covering in those communities. And so uh, Monique was involved in one in, in New Orleans, which was the first one. Um, and I think through that process, we gained a different level of access with the different federal agencies. And, and we really pushed for an interagency working group on this and so had representatives from the Department of Justice at all of the consultations in DC and, and nationally um, as well as participating in the review in Geneva. We had representatives from HUD, from the Department of Labor, from the Department of Education, um, Department of the Interior, Department of Homeland Security. Um, and the, the multiple goals on the part of civil society um, in participating in this process in the US Human Rights Network um, was working to coordinate the, the civil society participation and to push for transparency and accountability throughout this process. Um, and I think we gained a certain level of transparency and we continue to push for accountability. Um, and, and part of that push involves the establishment of uh, an executive order from, the Obama, from Obama that will formally establish an interagency working group to address international human rights issues, to look at our treaty obligations throughout the federal agencies, and then see what role the federal agencies can and should play in coordinating with state and local agencies um, for implementation of our human rights treaty obligations. Um, there was also a push through the Universal Periodic Review and, and probably the biggest recommendation made by all of the countries to the United States was the establishment of an independent human rights institution, a national human rights institution. Um, and what form that takes is, is up to discussion, and that may be something that would require um, act by, by Congress as opposed to the executive order. Um, but there really is a push um, with this administration and a hope that there are people who are sympathetic and friendly in this administration, although that has not borne fruit in the ways that I think we had hoped, um, that we could see some real movement. Um, but I do think that it has, the, the involvement around the Universal Periodic Review has changed the dialogue within the agencies, changed the way some of the agencies talk about human rights. There are now more people within the agencies who know that there is a human rights framework and who know what the Universal Declaration on Human Rights is and who know that housing is included in that and, and the right to, 
access to health care and the right to dignity through work and, and a whole host of rights are, are part of our international human rights obligations um, and trying to think a little bit differently. On the treaty ratification piece of it, um, the government had said that they would be submitting their um, ratification package to the Senate for the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. President Obama signed that shortly after he took office. Um, it's the newest of the UN Human Rights Treaties. That has not yet happened. I understand that there are sort of ongoing negotiations about what the package of reservations, understandings, and declarations will be part of that, and that's sort of the the packet that goes along with ratification to the Senate that says, okay, you can give your consent to ratification, but we will sort of have all these carve-outs, <laughs> um, with the biggest one being um, that the treaties are non-self-executing. Um, and so they're sort of trying to figure out what that package will be. The administration has stated its support for the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Um, and we stand with, I think, just six other countries and not having ratified that. Um, and it has also stated its support um, for the Convention on the Rights of the Child, although it's not prioritized that as a treaty. Uh, and the United States is the only country other than Somalia to not have ratified that. So, so Sarah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in here and just see if we can get in um, one more question before we yeah. um, uh, end up here. So thanks for that, um, that answer. And I think that, um, uh, as Marcia said these questions will be archived, so there'll be a chance to, um, you know, for some more dialogue in the future about them. Um, a couple of questions have come in about uh, housing and human rights, um, some concrete examples of using human rights in housing litigation or housing advocacy, and another question on health access and human rights. And um, one thing I think that those questions together raise is, you know, what do you think that those areas, housing and health access, are those areas that are really ripe for a human rights lens? And do you have suggestions about how someone might approach those areas? I'll open up to anybody there. I have a quick um, uh, story to share that might be helpful. Um, we, we worked with the ACLU of Puerto Rico and a bunch of local activists on behalf of a community of Dominican migrants who were, um, quote unquote, squatting on land owned by the government of Puerto Rico, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, um, after they had been displaced by the Hurricane George in the late 90s, and they had built a community basically from scratch. Um, it was in the suburb of San Juan. It was primarily um, single women headed households, about 200 families and 300 children. And they had, uh, you know, really built a thriving working class community. They commuted into San Juan for their jobs and went back to where they lived. It was a place called Villa del Sol. And um, the rumor was, well, without any uh, kind of notice, the government shows up one day with uh, police and tanks and tries to forcibly evict the community, telling them that they're located on a FEMA floodplain and they have to get out of there. And um, the community nonviolently resists. The police are really brutal. They have tear gas and bulldozers, and they try to get people to leave. But somehow, the, for seven hours, the community withstands it, even though like a pregnant woman is struck in the belly. Ch children are tear gas. It's really a horrible situation. So the government then tries to, to evict them um, you know, and, and they're they're challenging this in the Commonwealth courts, and they're not have because they don't have title of the land, um, they're they're unable to kind of prevail in the Commonwealth courts. And the government takes the step of cutting off the water and electricity to the community at a time when swine flu or H1N1 virus is running rampant and dengue fever is running rampant. And dengue fever, if you don't have running water, you have to collect rainwater in vats, and mosquitoes hatch eggs on top of that rainwater, and you can get dengue fever, which can be fatal. Um, H1N1 virus, obviously, if you can't wash your hands, um, you're more likely to get that. And unsurprisingly, an infant contracts H1N1 virus literally within weeks of them cutting off the water, almost dies. A woman gets dengue fever twice, almost dies. So it's a really dire situation in the community. And they're really not making progress via vis-a-vis -vis the uh, courts, uh, the Commonwealth Courts in Puerto Rico. So we worked with the um, Washington College of Law um, Human Rights Clinic um, and the ACLU of Puerto Rico and the local community to submit a uh, temporary, basically it's like a, it's called a request for precautionary measures. It's essentially asking for a temporary injunction at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And in, in relation to what Monique was discussing earlier, with the issue of enforcement, we kind of contemplated that even if we got the request for precautionary measures granted, that it wouldn't necessarily mean that we would get what we wanted. So as part of our, you know, we had affidavits, we did the whole legal filing. But in addition to that, we gave an advanced copy of the brief to the Associated Press 
they went interviewed the community. They documented the horrible conditions people were living in, the fact that people were bathing in an industrial canal, were drinking water from that canal that they purified with bleach because they didn't have any other water, and just how brutal the, the conditions were and the real threats to life and health. They documented all of that, and we, you know, told them, you can run the story, but not until, you know, this is an embargo copy of the brief. You can't file the story until after we file the complaint. So 28th of April last year, we filed a complaint like one in the afternoon. Two hours later, the AP runs a story on like 100 outlets worldwide. The governor of Puerto Rico happens to be in D.C. the same day, uh, you know, lobbying for international investment and Puerto Rico status, et cetera, et cetera. And because of the bad publicity from the filing and really from the AP story, that night the water in the community is resumed. Um, the governor, I guess, doesn't want it to be seen as like, you know, the human rights violator that he is. So that was an example of kind of combining the human rights litigation with realizing that the public attention and the media component to that is going to be crucial and that we may not get enforcement of judgment from a granted request for precautionary measures from the commission um, and, and in, in the context of housing and in health. And, I, and having spoken with other activists, like that's, that seems to be some of the kind of new forms of activism that people are using. Take Back the Land is another example of, of a movement that's using kind of public action and media documentation and really getting attention to an issue as a way to kind of, you know, sunlight as a, as a cure. So, I mean, I think this is something that we're all starting to think through a little bit, but it's helpful to share stories and examples. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Chandra. Any other last comments on that housing or access to health? I think we only have about a minute here. This is Cheryl Heisted. Um, just the, I'm sure a lot of you might know, but we've been working really closely with the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty, and they really focus on housing and human rights issues, and they've been a great help to us as identifying issues and trying to figure out how to frame our uh, human rights arguments. So if, if you're looking for um, help on that vein, I think they're, they're great. We've been working a lot on the source of income discrimination, which we see as a human rights issue, and basically landlords that refuse to rent to people that have Section 8 vouchers. And there's been a lot of movement and coalition building in Maryland to try to um, change a law in Maryland to prohibit that. And so um, that's a kind of an issue you could look at as a human rights issue, or you could look at it as a domestic issue. But um, we've framed it as a human rights issue and work with a lot of partners. And the human rights frame has seemed to help uh, really coalesce a, a good group of people. And we came close to getting it uh, through the state legislature during the last session. Um, and we're hoping that maybe it'll make it through the, in the coming year. That's great, Joe. Thank you. So um, thanks to the panelists. Marsha, I'm going to turn it back to you. For yeah, we time. are just about out of time. Um, I did want to tell everybody that, um, as I said, you'll get a link to the archive within a couple of days. And we will include, that'll, that'll be on our website, and we will include their email addresses for all the panelists so you can get in touch with them, uh, as well as um, links to some of the resources that, that people have discussed today. Um, you see here. Uh, this is an image of our current issue of Clearinghouse Review, and we're encouraging you to watch for the September-October issue, which will have a lot more information about a lot of these issues. Um, this is kind of new for a lot of people, getting into human rights. And I think it, you know, it's great to have the notion that additional doors might open as uh, we see a lot of doors being closed in terms of access to the courts and so forth. So uh, thanks, everybody, very much for participating. Again, look for the September-October issue. And you will also uh, receive a survey. We're very interested in your response to today's webinar and panel discussion. Thanks for all our panelists who uh, have told us really interesting stories about their work. And uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. <laughs>